you so much for joining us today for this really important discussion around accessibility, um, around disability equity. And um, I just think you're going to be a very interesting guest because you have a lot of experience in, a, in various different areas and lived experience as well as professional. But would you want to start off by introducing yourself and then I'll introduce myself properly? Yeah, so I'm Ryan Curtis Johnson and I'm Director of Communications at the Valuable 500. And just to give a visual description of myself, I'm a white male. I've got longish brown hair that's kind of comb over to one side. I'm wearing a cream roll neck jumper. I've got a green background with a sign that says all you need is love. Oh, lovely. And uh, I'll do the same. So my name is Gabby and I'm founder of Diversity Alliance and co-founder of Diverse Speaker Bureau. I have long, dark hair, which I semi brushed today. So it's a bit fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mixed race, so I have brown skin and I'm wearing red lipstick because it always makes me feel good. <laughs> and I've got a cream background and I love plants. So I've got a little plant in my background as well. because I think nature and greenery just helps to keep us a bit more calm. And I'm wearing kind of like a little bit of a Christmassy jumper because I've got some Demonte sparkly things hanging off with my beige jumper so I'm not gonna lie I was a little bit jealous about that jumper <laughs> your role at valuable valuable 500 and actually what valuable 500's mission actually is for those who have not sort of heard about it before yeah, 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 absolutely. So um, what, Valuable 500 is 500 CEOs. It's the largest CEO network, we like to say in the world, because uh, it is global, um, but the UN does come above us. But So, you know, it's, it's a nice second to come second to. Uh, we're a global collective of 500 CEO, CEOs and their companies are innovating together for disability inclusion. So each of those 500 CEOs have had to write a personal commitment with their own signatures, so their own wet signatures, to drive disability inclusion. Uh, the founder is Caroline Casey. She's a very inspirational woman. She's a TEDx talk person. She is a person, she, she describes herself in the most wonderful way, I believe, which is that she's a troublemaker and she's an activist and troublemaker always comes first. Um, and I think it's really important that um, this was something that she launched uh, in trying to drive um, and, and make a lasting change. And I think, you know, to put some context into, well, what does that mean? You know, we have a mission, which is, you know, driving that lasting change for 1.3 billion people around the world living with disability. Mm. So that's 15% of the population, basically. And I believe new figures that are just starting to come in that has slightly increased. So we're kind of getting closer to uh, to a higher percentage as well. And that is not just because of people who are born with a disability and have a visible or non-visible disability, but also an ageing population. And so an ageing population also then will fall into the category because of their accessible or uh, needs that they may need in life. And I think that's an important factor. Sorry, do you think it's also because maybe also, um, so visible and non-visible, yes, you did say that. So maybe because people are actually maybe more open and comfortable perhaps disclosing as well would that be another another factor or not so, not so much I, I think it's I think yes a little bit of that there's still a lot of negative steg stigma around people feeling comfortable and confident enough to come uh, come out with their disability for the for the reasons being especially within business I think there is a lack of data and you know that's what we're really trying to focus on uh, in our in our sort of strategy for 2023 um, but looking at you know reporting and, and gathering that data a lot of people don't disclose they have a disability within their workplace and the reason for that is because they think it will have a negative impact on them it will stall or stop progression or they will be in the firing line to be got rid of easier and also they feel that it could affect their flexibility as well within the workplace because their workplace may not be seen and I think it always comes back to a conveying of you know that whole stigma around disability as a whole is quite hard to get that sort of over the line um, and that's a really tricky one to look at. 100% I agree on that and I also speak a lot around intersectionality when we talk about kind of like identities and self-identifying and I sort of say you know inclusivity is for all it's not just for you know traditionally kind of underrepresented communities or all that visible kind of um, diversity that we see because at the end of the day as humans when we leave the workplace or sometimes even in the workplace we might have friends 
family, cousins, acquaintances who may be a person of color, who may be living with a disability, who yeah. may be, you know, suffering from mental illness. Like, we're going to have a touch point some way, even if it's not affecting us directly as an individual, there's going to be somebody within our circle who this is affecting. So this learning and education is for everyone. It's not just yeah. for those affected. And a lot of this, it feels like should, not a lot of it, but some of it should be common sense. Some of the easy things should be common sense. So I'm, I don't get, <laughs> sometimes I don't understand why we make things so difficult. And then I'm thinking, is it a financial thing? Do people think providing these additional kind of accessibility um, tools, resources, equipment, whatever it is, is too expensive? And that's a bit uh, of a round of question I've thrown out. No, it's not. It's, it's not. A, it's not. It's the first thing that comes up. We don't right. have the budget for it. Right. And now my answer to that, when I have spoken to lots of different people and places before, and especially throughout this year, is um, okay, okay. So you're willing to penalise a person because they have a disability. So it's that person's problem. It's that person's fault because they have a visible or a non-visible disability. Or, you know, the other common denominator that comes into it is, well, no one's asked. No one's asked for it. Oh, OK. Again, my answer to that question is so the onus is on the individual again. So you're a person or you're, you're a bit like me. Let's drive inclusive. You know, let's be inclusive. But hang on a sec. There's still a lot of people that think, you know, we'll only drive inclusive if you tell us that you need it. And that is what is fundamentally wrong. And that's where you need to change the DNA. So if you want to be inclusive and accessible to uh, your audience and your event, then mm. it doesn't matter about budget because it's a really small me amount of money, really, when you look at the grand scheme of things of any everything else that comes into play when you when you're putting on an event as such. Mm. It's a small it's a real small, small amount of money. That person shouldn't be penalised and that person shouldn't have to feel the need. What you should be doing is paving the way to sort of be, well, this is a fully accessible event. And if anybody turns up, they can access this because that's how it should work not yes we need to be told well who who are you waiting to be told there is that stigma already what we've already touched on people are scared to come forward people don't want to they're embarrassed there's lots of different reasons as to why people don't want to and they shouldn't have to if you want to do it do it lead the way and just be very good at it mm. it's, it's so interesting because because we talk a lot about well, how can we find out what people's needs are before they and it's not just coming to an event, it's like before they um, maybe start employment in a new company, whether that's attending a job interview or, or that is attending an event, like how do we find the information? And then, uh, you know, a lot of ideas kind of come about around seeking out in the registration process what people's needs are. But I agree with you. It does need to be, we're just doing it. We're just doing yeah. it. We're just getting a consultant on board or we're getting a specialist on board to do this for us because we we don't know we're not sure what we're doing you know a lot of people find that if they have accessibility needs in, in getting into a venue or a restaurant or you know any everyday things that maybe as a person who doesn't have uh, as an able-bodied person wouldn't even consider it's sometimes not a nice experience because you are taken around the back through the kitchen or through the fire escape or something that's not been cleaned in months or years <laughs> yeah. Someone's it, a fag. <laughs> yeah exactly there's rubbish bags and stuff yeah. like that and that's that's the other element that you have to really think about is the touch points of what does that experience look like? And I think there's there's elements of being able to use language rather than what are you do you have any accessibility needs or do you have any needs that could support your you know disability? Maybe what could help with your experience yeah. at this event? How could we make this experience as easy as possible for you? What's the best way for you to get the best out of this experience or this event? And mm -hmm. could you tell us? Because the wording sometimes is what also doesn't help. True. Where if it feels like it's come, which you've already talked about, from an empathetic place, it feels like someone genuinely cares, mm -hmm. that changes the whole concept. And I think from a lot of research I've recently done with bits and pieces regarding the travel industry and how people feel and people with disability, there's been a lot, you know, the summer has been rather chaotic when it comes to the travel and tourism industry. Some of the biggest things that they talk about from a, from a disability perspective is they just want to feel understood 
there's a lack of understanding there's a lack of representation there's a lack of understanding the need so there's a knowledge gap so hire people that are experts in accessibility and disability you know pay someone that can be that person that's going to then provide the best experience for that individual but not just for that individual for all because you just don't know who else might come forward and say you know what I do actually need a bit of quiet space or you know this is a bit too stimulating for me I need a quiet room is there a quiet room that mm. I can go um is there another way I can absorb this information and stuff like that mm. it's about really you know a lot of people think then I think that when it comes to it well that's another load of things we have to tick and go through and get to get onto the checklist well it only will feel like that at the start because you've never done it before once you change that and you make it part of the process it doesn't feel like that and it's probably the same as you know when you're putting on an event you load in and load out you have a checklist to make sure that you do it correctly and that's how it works and that's all we're trying to say is you've missed a layer yeah uh, and that's that, that's the key and this is where training people like what you already do with diversity uh, mm -hmm. alliance is training people so that they can really understand and then they can deal in those situations without making that person feel uncomfortable yeah. like they're a nuisance yeah. yeah like they're a problem which is such a common denial. like all the report in research that we recently put out they are the most common words that we use feel like a burden mm -hmm. feel like I'm not respected feel like I'm not treated like everybody else I mean that is just how is that right or fair it's not so how how can we lead the way of changing that so that when you're doing all these various channels of whether it's your event planning the experience mm. how is everybody going to get the same experience regardless of what their wants or their needs are yeah exactly i'm really glad that you touched on the education point there a little bit because what I notice when I work with um, organizations is that quite often they just want to know the practicals like okay what well, just tell us what we need to do what, what 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 do we need to implement what and I'm a bit like you need to understand why first the why you need yeah. to hear about the actual experiences because that's how we learn isn't it we experience things in different ways whether we and hear somebody speaking about it whether we watch a, a video or a visual or a film that highlights these issues and whether we we physically walk through do a walk through that experience that's how we really learn and how it becomes easier then to to make adjustments or adaptions yep. or just create new ways of experiences or ways of doing things but irritated with the like just tell us what we need to do like tick box exercise no you need to know why and you, you know, need to educate yourselves yeah and you need to be fully informed and if you can't be fully informed you need to have someone who is it's as simple as that